Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much for being here. Uh, leading into Father's Day, as we navigate this, this fight for racial equality, we have a real opportunity here to share a very important perspective from people within our own organization. And that's the perspective of a Black father and what it means to be a Black father in America, not just during this time, but in general, the emotions, the conversations, the lessons. And that's what this roundtable is all about. And we have a fantastic group of employees to shed light on this perspective. Um, we have Will Dawkins, Vice President of Intelligence and Identification, Mike Wilkes, Assistant Coach for the Thunder, Michael Cage, Thunder Broadcast Analyst, Ade Amuda, Manager of Events and Entertainment, KJ Campbell, Motion Graphics Animator and Editor, and Michael Ashton, Physical Therapist and Athletic Trainer. I'll start here because I think it's important to acknowledge the feelings and emotions that are happening within each individual family right now. So um, Will, I'll start with you, open the floor up to you. What's been going through your head as a black father during this time? Yeah, I first wanna thank you Paris for kind of getting us all together and giving us an opportunity to speak and share and, and talk amongst. There's, there's guys on this call that I've had conversations with during this time individually. So to be able to get everybody together is always a good thing. Um, there, there's a lot going on to kind of answer that question. Uh, a full, full range of emotions. Um, you, you have the anger, you have the sadness, you have the discontent um, that, that comes with seeing everything and it being in your face, but also knowing that it's touching and affecting so many people that you're close to um, and that you, you care about. So the anger doesn't go away, um, but seeing some of the positivity that's come out of it is where that has slowly turned into some excitement um, to where you see some of the, the rallies and the protests, having people that um, are more diverse within us and within the crowd working with us. Like those things are good to see. Um, as bad as this pandemic has been, um, a positive has been a chance to be around family and talk to your family. Um, and be able to sit down and have some of these conversations and learn. So that's been a good thing. But then also with social media, um, the words being spread and people are seeing it because they're at their home. So people are becoming more and more knowledgeable about it. So it's frustrating to see that it's still going on. Um, but at the same point, I do feel positive that more people are talking about it and the words being spread. So the array of emotions have, depends on the day and depends on how much I'm looking at my phone. But um, as you can imagine, some, some of the other guys will attest to that there's a lot we're feeling right now. Yeah, I, I want to open this up to everybody. Um, let, let's go, Adi. Adi, what, what are some of the emotions that you're feeling as a Black dad right now? Yeah, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, Will kind of touched on it. I mean, there's uh, a lot of emotion right now. Um, it's um, A lot of it's built up um, over the years, of course, over the uh, last 400 years and where this is all stemmed from it's a lot of built up frustration uh, um, anger um, fatigue just over um, the oppression over you know over the last decades and centuries um, and you know he mentioned it it's like well you know we, we there are some you know a lot of people are talking about this right now and with talking it talking about it, it's you know, raising the overall awareness, I feel like. Um, before, it was a topic that, you know, was kind of swept under the rug uh, in terms of um, the difficulty of the discussion. Um, but now we are more focused on, you know, the topic as a whole and what we can do um, and what's been going on. Even during this quarantine alone, um, the amount of, scenarios situations that's happened since we've since you know march or so has um really really shed light on this whole um situation um but as a father yeah i mean it's it, it makes you think about you know what 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 could happen what, what the possibilities are so um my daughter she's only five right now but you know, when she grows up older, I mean, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, that's going to be something that she's going to have to be taught about and um, about the culture, about the awareness and um, and about where this is all come from. So, um, but yeah, you know, 
toss it to anyone else that wants to kind of piggyback off of that. Yeah, Mike Wilkes, you have two young boys. What's going through your head? Like, like everyone has already said, a wide range of emotions. Um, you know, going to school in Houston, um, where George Floyd is from, I have friends there that knew him, that spent time with him. One of my close friends actually spoke at his funeral. And when it happened, I got text messages from him, you know, videos that he had um, of him and the time that he spent. So, you know, initially some anger, initially, you know, some mourning, because, you know, when, when your loved ones suffer, you know, a loss, you mourn with them. And then having two, two young, you know, black boys, ages 12 and eight, um, you know, just thinking about the future for them um, and, and what, what will it be like? Will they experience some of the, um, I guess, emotions and things that I have to try to navigate, you know, quite often as, as a black man and hoping that, you know, I can figure out ways to create change, you know, for them. But also, you know, my mind directly goes to how can I prepare them to be able to navigate and handle um, some of the things that they may face out in this world. So. Um, like Will said, you know, it's, it's been good to see um, some of the support um, from, you know, my brothers and sisters of different races um, and then my people coming together and mobilizing and, and protesting for positive change. And, you know, hope, I'm hoping that we can put some action behind it. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, my faith always keeps me grounded in what I come back to, you know, because at times you feel a little hopeless. Like, man, this has been going on for a while and things aren't going to change. But, you know, I have to, you know, continue to believe, you know, and that things can, you know, get better. Michael Ashton. Yeah, I'd echo the sentiments of everyone before me. It's like a vicious cycle of the grief cycle. And you just can't get out of it. You know, you go through the array of emotions of anger, bargaining, just mourning, and it's just repeat, repeat, repeat. And in this case, being a father now, like I'm in a different position where now I have to shoulder even more of a burden because when you're single and you only have to worry about yourself, of course, I mean, it's like, okay, I need to take care of myself. But now, not only do I have to take care of myself for me, but I'm the leader of my household. And so now I have others who are depending on me, not only for me just to be around, but to educate them and prepare them for this world. And this is just a huge issue and looking at it, it's like, this can be so overwhelming because where I've been the recipient of others trying to prepare for this moment, it's now falling on my shoulders for, to prepare my children for these same things. And I'm glad to see that there is some action that seems to be moving in a positive direction, but it does not ease that burden of knowing that I need to prepare my children for this. And this is, it's tough, it's really tough. KJ? Uh, yeah, um, I think we all share uh, that anger. Um, being a black father, you, when, when you see these things go on outside of your home, uh, you relate to it instantly because that could be you as a father, or that could be you as a son. And to put yourself in that position and that feeling is terrible. And um, it's just, it's, it's, it's becoming a cycle for young black men to lose their lives in the streets. And it's, uh, it's, it's tough to watch. And uh, just during this time, I'm just glad that, you know, every race has a chance to actually become educated, have the chance to become educated and understand what's going on out here while we're fighting so hard, while we're out in the streets and protesting and, and while we're speaking up about these injustices not just in the streets but in the workplace as well um you know you're surrounded by people sometimes that don't understand your pain because it's not their reality and uh, that's that that's where it's, it, it always becomes an issue especially right now if it's not your reality you don't understand why this person is reacting like this and you think it's uh you know just 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 out of control but uh you know, this whole thing has been out of control for a while. And I feel like the fight and the, and like, like, like we all said, the anger that we have in us, it's just, it's just finally, you know, forming together to be able to all fight together and uh, get our point across 
and just just continue to try to better ourselves and our community. And Michael Cage, you have a unique perspective on this because your children, they're, they're in their 20s now. And, you know, you, you have a unique experience with your history. So how, how is how what's going through your head right now with that in mind? Well, well first of all, just great seeing everybody. Uh, congratulations. Uh, happy Father's Day. Um, you know, I, I think it's a powerful moment when you can get people together to talk about relevant issues. And a lot of times it's unpleasant. A lot of times it's, it's ugly. A lot of times you don't have the answers, but I, I think it starts with conversations. I think it starts with the identity of, or even, you know, what we have in common as fathers, husbands, and, and, and whatnots. For me, um, you know, this is American history, man. Whether we like it or not, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now, we will still be talking about the polarizing events of 2020. And I think the one that will top it will, will not be the pandemic. It will not be the economy that happened uh, in 2020. It will be, uh, you know, the racial uh, injustice. It will be the movement that started that. It would be the, the momentum behind it that's happened. Now for me, uh, fellas, let me share a little bit with you. I was, you know, I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. I grew up in a little small town in Arkansas. Uh, when I was six years old, Martin Luther King was assassinated less than 10 miles from my home. And I remember my mom coming in the room, putting her head in my lap, crying hysterically. And I was like a kid, I'm six years old. I don't know what to do when my mom comes in and she's, I've never seen her cry like that. And she says, he's, he's gone. And they got him. And I'm like, still like hands up. Mom's just got her head on her lap crying. And she says, um, they killed Martin Luther King, son, uh, about an hour ago. Now I was six years old. I knew who Martin Luther King was even at six because he was such a polarizing figure for all of us, you know, not, not just that, you know, people of the South. And, and it just shocked me and, and it froze me. And I felt, I felt helpless. I felt afraid. I felt intimidated. I felt fear of like nothing I've ever felt before when, cause I felt like I couldn't do anything. And I, and I was, you know, and here's my mom crying like this and I still can't uh, do anything. So when I finally was able a couple of years to understand the importance of that moment, and it's a shame that like today, it had to come at the hands of someone being murdered, murdered publicly for uh, uh, this to come to the forefront of all our conversations in such a challenging and tough year as 2020 has been, man. We're just halfway through it. And, and then I look at you know how these events down the road had shaped what uh, affected me, what affected you, because about four years later, I was, you know, there was segregation in the South. I was a part of desegregation. My, I, when I went from the third to the fourth grade, I heard, you know, all of a sudden my mom told me, you can't go to this school, this all black school that was two blocks from my house. And I was like going, mom, come on now, why? You know, I, my friends, neighborhood, I know the teachers. In fact, my first grade teacher was my aunt. You know, why can't I go? She says, you have to go across town. I didn't understand at the time. She says, you know, what she explained to me a year later, this is desegregation. You know, and I realized that this change came at the hands of a lot of people's lives, not just Martin Luther King. And then when I, you know, went to an all white school from fourth grade on up, it really gave me a different perspective on life. And I realized, cause I, you know, I stayed on the black side of town in the sixties and seventies and the white people stayed on the white side of town. It's just how I was until I started playing sports. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was playing with other players that were white and we became friends. And I realized they were no different than me. I realized that they had the same um, disgust that I had at the time. And then when I got into high school, I realized that a lot of things, uh, I couldn't change globally, nationally, but there were things that I could do within my own city. And that was when I learned to just 
you know, uh, start talking with other people that, you know, mainly white people that I didn't trust at the time because of all the things that happened. And then you fast forward that to my college years where I left Arkansas to go to school in California. And I started to see the world for what it was. And I realized that there were economic situations and there were other races in this country that were somewhere going through the same situation. And I saw that it was getting better, but it wasn't enough. And, and I think that when you look forward to where we are now, you know, we, we're nothing's really changed other than the fact that this situation right now is moving more, is moving faster than what was happening in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And unfortunately, but fortunately, I was in Los Angeles in 91 when the Rodney King situation happened and, and the riots started, you know. So, you, you know, for me, the, the, to see where we are today and, and to, to like sit here and, and say, hey, I've been blessed, you know, I don't know if it's a blessing, but it, I'll say it, it's been a, a blessing to see, you know, this evolution from where we were back in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And then all of a sudden I see more, I see more people talking about race relations today than I have in the past 25 years. And, and I think that's great. I, I think it's great that people are disgusted with what they're seeing, that people, you know, that there are black people being executed on, on you know, on film. You know, and that's the thing that we didn't have before. That's like, look, this has been going on. He was making a good point, And it's something that I do want to offer up to everyone else. His experience was unique to him. But does anybody else have that experience in their life that affected how they want to raise their kids? And I know, KJ, you and I spoke before on, you know, growing up in South Carolina and, you know, how that affected how you want to raise your 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 son. Uh, yeah, growing up in the South, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a thing where racism is just always in your face at all times. Uh, you just either experience it or you see it firsthand. Uh, I know, you know, when, like we spoke about the experience that I had with my dad, uh, facing racism and police, police brutality all in one. Um, I'll just give you guys a quick rundown of that. Um, it was a situation where my sister uh, had called the cops because someone had came behind her and hit her as she was entering her apartment. Um, she didn't re she didn't retaliate. She just went and called the cops. Uh, the cops showed up, and then we also showed up uh, as a family. So when we get to my sister's place, my sister is in handcuffs on the on the ground. And of course, you know, you, you come up, you're a parent, you're, you're trying to figure out what's going on. If you're the one assaulted, why are you in handcuffs? So my mom is, you know, being a little bit, being a mom, trying to figure out, and uh, the cop tells her to back up. And he starts being a little disrespectful. And my dad steps in and say, hey, you don't have to talk to my wife in that way. I don't know why the cop felt such a, such aggression or, or threat from that. I don't know if it's because my dad is taller and bigger or what. But, uh, you know, the conversation keeps going and he tries to arrest my dad. So by now, I'm, I'm out there as a kid. I'm, I'm in eighth grade and I'm seeing all this happen and tries to arrest my dad. And my dad is like, you know, no, I'm, I'm not getting arrested. What? And he's trying to figure out, like, what am I getting arrested for? Then the cop goes to spray a uh, mace in my dad's eyes and in his mouth all at the same time. And uh, at that point, I'm, I'm getting scared because it, it's, it's like the situation is losing control. But uh, in that moment, you know, my dad, he, uh, you know, he, he, he's shown his strength, you know, as a man and, and, and as a dad, you know, I'm standing there right beside him, but he, he doesn't become irate. You know, he doesn't lunge at these officers. He doesn't uh, start cursing him out or anything you know he, he he holds his position as a man and as a father and he shows me you know how to how to act in in situations to where you face with such terrible adversity and uh you know he was handcuffed and put in the back of the car still maced out um I'm in my sister's apartment crying by now because you know I've never seen you know my dad hurt before 
or I've never seen anybody try to weaken my dad. And uh, for a kid to see his dad act like that in such a situation, it, it just stems down to me wanting to show that strength and wanting to show that, that, that calmness and, and that rationale um, to my son. You know, I have a five-year-old, and uh, for, for him to be coming up in this stage, I, that's all I want to instill in him. And, and I have to, you know, my background being from South Carolina, and uh, experiencing racism, you know, myself, uh, and seeing my family experience it, I, I have to make sure that my son knows that it exists, um, that he may come, that a time may come to where he faces it. And I need him to understand that, hey, this is how you handle it. And you handle it in this way to show them that you cannot, but you can't belittle me, um, that I've been shown the strength and I've been educated by my father who's experienced these things that, you know, no matter what you say or what you do to me, that I, I will persevere. And uh, I'm, I'm strong and I'm intelligent and, you know, this does not define me. You know, you saying these things and acting this way towards me doesn't define me just because that's who you think that I am. Yeah. And Michael Ashton, you mentioned that you were the recipient of some of that advice that you want to pass down. What, what was some of that advice that you, you got that you want to be able to pass forward? I would say the biggest piece of advice that I can remember off top was, I mean, repeatedly being told, learn how to respond and not react. I mean, very similar to him. I grew up in West Virginia, which is very similar to South Carolina, where we don't make up a large part of that population. So I have my fair share of experiences as well. And like, I'm fortunate for those because having to have confronted that and to have gone through that as a young child, and also having the mentorship of my family of educating me along the way of, yes, this is wrong, but you cannot react. You have to respond appropriately because a reaction is based off of emotion. A lot of time it happens subconsciously. To respond, you have to take a pause. And sometimes taking a pause is a lack of a response. You don't necessarily have to respond at all. But just understanding that this is something that you're going to see again in life, which I have every step along the way. But in each one of those positions, you have to know how to respond. What about you, Will? It's difficult even like thinking back um, because it's, it's not fair that um, we have to train our kids in this way. And it's not fair that we had to be taught this way. Um, during this time, I spent a lot of time talking to my father, my uncle, like the men who helped raise me. Um, Cause obviously their kids are older. My kids are younger, three and two, and you kind of want to protect them at this point. Um, let them know that they aren't any different and that they will be treated the same, knowing that at some point you will have to have that talk with them. Um, so, as a parent, like you're, you want to protect your kids, you want to provide for your kids, um, and you want to advise them the best you can. And the scary piece is, and even talking to my dad to this day, um, you worry every time your son, your daughter, I leave the house. My dad worries when I go on trips to different cities, whether it's go scouting for college basketball in some small rural areas, or I'm in different countries often. Um, and he's like, I don't know how you're going to be treated. I don't know how to protect you when I'm around you. I tried to model that behavior, um, and show you how to deal with things, but there's going to be times where you have to work harder just to get to the starting line. And that's a prerequisite that shouldn't be the case, but it is. And you're going to be called upon and you're going to be picked on and not get things and not being treated as equally. And this is how you have to respond in those situations to stay alive and come back to your family. Um, so they're, they're tough things to think about. I think everybody on here can give examples of when they were pulled over, um, put inside a police car. It's happened multiple times to me. So when you're seeing these images, like it hits home right away and without violation, just for the DWB and in different states throughout the country, it's not just one place. So um, those things are hard to think about. Um, 
and seeing it in 2020 is I can't go back as far as Cage has and seeing the development, but this is nothing new, which is like the hard part when you're seeing it. And um, I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. So um, spent a lot of time in Boston and, and things of that nature. So there's different things to be a New Englander and good and positive and things of that nature. So uh, when you go through things in life, if you're not learning from it and helping the people behind you, you're not, in my opinion, doing what you're supposed to do. So the conversations that are happening right now are great. Um, my brother and a bunch of close friends back in Springfield, Mass, where I'm from, um, put together a yearly thing where um, we give back and give seminars to kids on a bunch of different topics every spring, um, middle school, high school age kids. And five years ago, we had four years ago now, we had Quentin Williams come back and give a seminar on his book, How Not to Get Killed by the Police. And some people are like, why would you do that? Why would you ever do that? But they haven't been in our situation. They haven't been in our shoes. And this is four or five years ago, we're teaching kids, as soon as you get pulled over, you're doing this. You're putting the keys up here. This is how you respond. And these kids aren't being taught that. But at the same time, they shouldn't be have to be team being taught that, but we have to do our part. So like seeing it now is the anger and frustration that I talked about at the beginning. When you're young, you see your family go through it. Then you get older, you go through it. Then you see the next generation and nothing's changing. That's as I get older, it's like more and more frustrating and harder to deal with. And as a parent, it's like, at what point do I have those conversations with my kids? And one of the people I called right away um, when all this stuff was going and I couldn't get it out of my head was Mike because we're close and his two kids are older in age. So I'm like, what are you telling your boys? And how can I tell my three-year-old who's asking questions, but I want to protect them at the same time? Yeah, Mike, what are you telling them right now? I mean, it's, it's really not a new conversation for me. Um, I'm from the inner city of Milwaukee, one of the most, um, I guess you can call it segregated cities in the country in terms of race and poverty. Um, just just navigating that, just like everybody, most most of the men on this call, you all have, we all have our stories. Um, where you're not doing anything particularly wrong and you experience certain things. And so I'm constantly telling my kids, especially, you know, in the area where we live, where we live in, um, the schools that they go to, a lot of times they're often like the only black kids in their class and stuff. So, you know, I, I, I speak into them all the time, you know, their identity, who they are. Again, our faith is, is, is big in our household. So I'm constantly speaking into them in terms of, who they are according to the word of God. I'm constantly telling my son, you're, you're, you're not inferior to anybody. Um, giving him confidence, giving him, uh, you know, self-esteem. And then, but at the same time, trying to prepare him as well without um, causing him to be fearful, but under, you know, letting him know that sometimes you, we got to navigate a little bit differently. You know, most people are good. Most cops are good. But unfortunately, you're going to come across some situations and you got to be able to know how to handle yourself to be to be able to navigate it. He's been in the car with me when I've been pulled over before. And so I give him the rules that <laughs> my mom gave me, you know, don't reach for anything. Have the have your license and registration on your dashboard before the cops even get up there so that your hands are in plain view. You know, be respectful. Um, it was things growing up in the inner city, you know. My mom would tell me, you know, what to wear, what not to wear, when to be in the house at a certain time, you know, how to carry myself, always get a receipt when you go to the store, even if it's just for a pack of gum. Um, and so just, you know, just really trying to instill in my kids, like who they are. Um, I talk to them about, you know, our history as a people, get them a sense of pride of, of where we come from and what we've done. And uh, just, just constantly trying to speak into them. Um, but also try to get help them develop those instincts that I feel like they're going to need to be able to navigate in this world. And Ade, you have a unique perspective on this too, just with your parents being immigrants and, you know, raising a young five-year-old daughter, it's a different conversation when they're younger, but how, how has that experience affected how you want to raise her? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, my parents are um, from from Nigeria, born and raised, and uh, you know they came here uh, in the '80s. 
Um, so, you know, they just basically started here from ground zero. So I've, you know, just appreciated um, everything that they've done for, uh, you know, for me and my family just growing up. Um, so they've, they've had a, a, you know, different perspective on everything as well. Um, the biggest thing for me, and like you mentioned, yeah, I do have a daughter. And I think that's why discussions like these are so huge is that, you know, you know, seeing how other fathers, uh, how other African-American fathers are teaching their kids and the words that they are instilling in them. And it's helping me as well to uh, formulate my thoughts um, into, you know, what I'll tell my daughter. Even though I have a daughter, unfortunately, it's not any different than um, having, you know, a son. I mean, the same things apply for both male and females. I mean, we've had scenarios um, going back, you know, to who knows how long um, with uh, women as well. So, um, but yeah, the biggest thing for me is just, um, you know, Wolf, that I want to tell her is just to have all overall sense of awareness, uh, knowledge. Um, and that from what I hear from the other guys, that's the things that they're, you know, telling their sons as well. Um, and I also, you know, just, I, personally, I wish it wasn't such a subjective viewpoint on how to address, uh, you know, yourself in those situations. I wish it was more an objective viewpoint or objective uh, concrete way of, you know, hey, this is how we need to go about this. Because I feel like, you know, it's it's different. I'm, all of us have our different experiences and how we, uh, you know, are, are handling ourselves in those situations. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, you know, as she grows older, and like everyone has said, you know, just having that knowledge, that cultural awareness, uh, uh, the knowledge about where we've come from, where we are today, and knowing you know where you stand uh in a classroom and, um outside that when you're driving and um just out on your own those are the t type things that you know we have to equip them for um which we didn't have to equip them for but that is the reality uh today um so yeah and at such a young impressionable age it's it's hard to have the full heavy conversation right it's hard to have the talk that everybody is talking about what you do when you get pulled over by the police but kj what are some of the things that you're teaching your son now at you know five years old that maybe maybe the small things that you can start building going towards him growing up yeah uh so trey uh he has a slight speech delay so I have to take my time with explaining things to him so that, you know, he catches on and comprehends it. Um, but the, you know, I just try to keep it simple for him so he can, you know, build on these kind of things like don't mumble when you talk, always speak with confidence and courage, uh, keep, hold your head up when you walk, look people in the eye when you talk to them. And, uh, you know, when, when you're out and about, be kind. Um, to others, even though you won't always see it, just be kind uh, and, and, and be, be aware of situations. And um, right now, I just feel like that's the, that's the basis of, of us building on to get into these talks to where I explain to him, okay, this is why I've always told you this. So now I need you to apply it when you get in these certain type of situations. And from that, I think, you know, that's, 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 that's just something that is important to talk to him about right now as a five-year-old. Um, and I, like Audie said, I hate that we have to have these type of conversations with our kids leading into telling them how to, you know, react and respond in certain situations. Um, but it's, it's almost as if, uh, you know, we, we can't dodge these conversations anymore. Well, you mentioned it. Uh, you're, you're already getting questions. And I'm curious, you, two and three years old, what, what are some of those questions? He's an inquisitive three-year-old, if you guys have met him. Uh, he's got a, a, a mind beyond his years. So he picks up on a lot. Um, and the, to be honest, the, the questions he's asking the most concern more about the pandemic right now. Why are people sick? Um, we've had family members that have gotten sick, but faithfully, and they've been able to beat it. Um, 
So like asking questions on that and why can't I go here right now? Why daddy, are you working from home? Like what's, why are you not going into that office? So the majority of them have been about that. Um, but when he comes in and he walks and I have to give him that talk, it's like, daddy, why are people mad? Why, why are the cops doing this? And aren't police good? And like Mike said, you got to kind of shield them at a certain point um, and let them know that uh, things are happening and keep it on a smaller level to where he feels reassured about it. Um, but I also don't want to ignore those questions. And my wife and I have conversations about how to approach that with our children. Um, my wife's Native American. I'm obviously Black. So there's going to be a lot of different situations and um, injustice and things that don't go their way that they'll have to fight maybe extra hard than they should to achieve in life. So at what point do you have that conversation? We've talked about that, but um, like the gentleman said on, on this call, like you're, you're instilling those things into them at an early age so that um, when they get to a point, you can have those conversations. But right now it's, it's very surface level, um, but I refuse not to answer them and be honest with them. So um, it's something we, I, I do take seriously and, enjoy after that we can go watch cartoons but we're gonna have some serious moments um, my two-year-old daughter is just like eh, i'm good but little man it, he wants to know what's going on it's like kj said it's a conversation that unfortunately we can't avoid and you have to confront no matter what age the the child maybe who's asking the question but on the other end of the spectrum we have michael cage and his kids who are embarking on the world now as young adults. Uh, Michael, what are some of the conversations you're having with them, especially from your perspective, raising biracial children as well? Well, Paris and, and everybody, uh, you know, my wife is white. My kids are, you know, obviously biracial. And I, you know, from the time they were little, I really told them the truth about my life. You know, you know, I'm not proud of the fact that I was, that close to Martin Luther King in 1968, April 4th, when he was assassinated, that I was a part of desegregation and, and um, you know, and all the other things that proceeded from that, I made sure that they understood that, you know, my, my kids are all grown now. My oldest daughter, um, she's 24, turning 25 next month. My son is 23. Uh, my youngest daughter is 21. So, you know, we've had that conversation. Now, what's really um, amazing, I might get ahead of myself here, is that they bring this conversation to me, what's going on right now. They are eyes wide open, ears wide open. They fully understand everything that's going on. And, and, you, know, and you know, I haven't had to have this conversation with them collectively because they'll call me or they'll text me and say, dad, do you believe this? Dad, this happened again, you know? And they, they're, they're like conscious of it and their friends are conscious of it. And, you know, so for me being, you know, a father of adult children, you know, it's a lot easier to have that conversation, you know, than, than probably a lot of the, you know, gentlemen that are on this call right now, because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really heavy conversation. It's a very mature conversation. And, and so it's really been an engaging uh, conver you know, uh, talk that I've had with the kids about this and them, them texting me and, and, you know, before I can text them. And, you know, so I really see the value in that, that they understand who they are. And I tell them they know it, that the world sees you as black, even though your mom is white and your father is black, you have a white grandmother, you have a black grandmother, you know, but the world will see you as black. And, and they know that, and they understand that, and, and making them comfortable uh, with that, who you are, where you're from, you have a white history, you have a black history, that's your history. You know, that's the, that's the America of, of, of where we're going. We're, we can't not get past these moments until we get past these conditions. And, and it's like a, a perfect storm that's happened right now with this pandemic, um, you know, this economic situation, and now the racial tension that's, you know, polarizing the country. That's a lot. Usually you, you can't 
have all of that happening in three months. You know, that's pretty heavy, you know, and I haven't seen this at any time in my 58 years, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a moment where I think, you know, all the gentlemen here are point on, you're spot on. When you feel, you know, it's time to talk to them about it because it's going to be America. It's, so it's American history for them. Five, 10 years from now, when it hits the books, this is going to be one of the topics of conversation. I like that. I'm encouraged by that. Uh, I, I think my kids realize that because I have to really remind them that, look, you know, yes, you know, the world sees you as black, but you know what, you're both. And your father is your father and your mother is your mother. And, and you know, the blessing that you have is that you have these perspectives in your house. And, and it's really been, you know, almost like a godsend right now for them to understand, you know, this side, because it's not like they didn't grow up without some kind of, you know, male black presence in their life. You know, I've been around them all their life and they see that and they're putting this together on their own and they're talking about it with their friends. One of my daughter is in Louisville. My oldest daughter is in Seattle and uh, my, my son is here in Oklahoma City. You know, so, you know, that that whole conversation, it's an easy, easy conversation to have with adult children. It's just like we're sitting here as adults having, it's very easy. It's, it's ugly, it's uncomfortable, it's horrible, it's depicable, but we're talking about it. And I think that's where we grow from this. And I think that's where we, we, you know, I don't have the answers right now, but I think that when we start talking about it collectively, everybody, small groups, small groups, small groups, like we're doing with our shelter in place, I think that's when we start to find a solution. We start to grow beyond, you know, this kind of behavior and treatment of human beings in this country. One of the things that I'm hearing a lot of just from everybody that is that is talking is no matter what age they they're listening and they understand and they know what's going on. And one thing that I keep hearing is confidence, comfortable self-esteem. Why why is that so important, especially for a, a black child to, to have that confidence at such a young age? Uh, Michael Ashton, I, I, I'll send that to you. Well, I think my situation is probably different than everybody's on here because my children are at a stage where they can even speak yet. So like even going beyond what they're saying, and I'll touch on what you just asked by starting with what you were previously talking about, with where they are in their developmental stage, I mean, right now, the majority of their learning is coming from what they hear and what they see. And my wife and I are really deliberate and intentional in what we do in front of their eyes. I mean the way we interact with each other, the way we interact with our neighbors, um, what we're showing them on TV, the type of books that we're reading that reflects what they're gonna see in life, you know, making sure that they're seeing diversity in the characters that we're reading in books or that they're seeing on television. You know, it's been a blessing to be a part of this organization where there is a lot of diversity. So even when we're taking them to the games or they can see everybody interact with each other. There's understanding that, you know, you have to operate off a basis of love because we're definitely based off faith and spirituality in our home. So, and with that, that starts with the foundation of knowledge of self, knowing who you are, being the author of your own story. I mean, simple as that because everybody's gonna have an opinion of you, but if you don't know who you are and you're not proud of who you are, then you're gonna allow somebody else's perception to create your story. So be the author of your own story, walk with confidence, walk boldly, but be loving. I mean, and really just be a good human being. That's where it starts. I love that, be the author of your own story. M Mike Wilkes, you, you've got a little bit older kids. Why is it so important to have, for them to have that confidence in themselves? I mean, I agree with a lot of things that Mike Ashton just spoke about. Um, what I would add to that is I think confidence gives you the ability to persevere and to endure. Um, you know, I tell my son all the time and not just related to like race related things, but everything in life isn't going to go your way. And you have to, and, and, you know, we talk about what are we trying to instill in our kids? You know, I'm trying to instill in him, um, love, 
I'm trying to instill in him certain mentalities. Um, you're gonna face you're gonna face obstacles, but I don't want my son to have a a victim's mentality, um, meaning that yeah, you're gonna face adversity, but I want you to have so much confidence and belief that you believe that you can overcome um, any obstacle that is thrown in your way. It may take you some time, but it won't stop you. And so, you know, in my household, I speak things, you're more than a conqueror. Um, you know, you can do all things, you know, through Christ who strengthens you. Um, and just helping him to understand and speak like who he is into in him. So, you know, I named my, my baby boy Josiah, he's named after a king. And so, you know, and so, you know, I call him, hey, king, you know, and just give my kids that confidence, that belief. I think um, it gives them the courage to dream big. I think it gives them the courage to persevere. Um, um, I, I think, you know, it helps them to, to keep pushing and, and believe that they can have, not only have, but to become, you know, great in this world in spite of the things that they face. That confidence not even related to race, just to persevere and overcome. And I love that. It, the more he hears King, the more he resonates with that. That is me. I am King. Uh, Ade, I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you want your daughter to see in you? You know, as, as fathers, what I'm hearing is, you know, you want to be able to set that example for your kids and let them see what you want for them in you. So Ade, I'm, I'm curious, what example do you want to set for, for your daughter? Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a summation of what everyone has been saying. Um, uh, you know, confidence, um, just an individual, especially as a woman. Um, unfortunately, there may be situations where, you know, she uh, may be looked over just like any one of, a, any one of us, but um, having that sense of confidence, um, you know, will help her over any obstacles. And a lot of us have touched on is that, you know, if we start to instill that in them at such a young age, um, you know, despite the situations, despite the obstacles that may come out, come around, despite, you know, the pitfalls that people may tell you, there may be people that tell you that you're not good enough, you cannot do, but if we learn to teach into our kids that have a strong character, and to stick by your foundation, stick by your faith, that's their baseline. They're not gonna steer from that. And that's definitely one thing that I want to, you know, instill into my daughter as she's, I mean, she's five years old now, so everything she's seen is, I mean, she's just soaking it in. People's wearing masks, um, you know, and, and you know, she's seeing the news as well. She, she would be like, you know, why is everybody in the street? And I'm not shying away from it. I mean, she, it's, it's a topic that has to be discussed. And um, with her, with me telling her uh, and teaching her these things, it will carry on to when she's 10, 15, 20 years old and hopefully encourage her um, to be strong, be a strong woman, uh, be outspoken, um, don't be shy. Don't let anyone tell you anything different, you know, and just to have that strong mentality, um, you know, as she grows up because uh, and there's no one else, you know, apart from, you know, my, from my, myself and my wife, um, she's relying on us, you know, to uh, bring her up. So, and I take pride in that. Um, and I take pride in, you know, encouraging her and uh, to get around those pitfalls that we may have, you know, fell into when we were growing up. So, yeah. Yeah. Paris, I kind of want to add on to what Adi was saying. Like being a parent is tough. It's not easy. Um, but it's also like awesome. Like it's the best part of your day when you come home. Um, and having a son and raising him to be tough and all these other things that you want little boys to be. And learning from my father, whose work ethic was here, was working two, three jobs for 30, 40 years of his life to make sure that we were okay and provide. Like, you want to instill the confidence, the work ethic, some of those things that are so important to you with faith being number one, that's like been the best part of this, able to teach him and walk him through some of those things. But the second my daughter was born, it was like completely different. And that mindset just shifts. And it's like, wow, it's my baby girl now. There's going to be enough people in this world that are going to try to tear you down that I am not going to be one 
that's going to do anything like that. I'm only going to build you up. So while I'm speaking confidence to my son as well, like I'm speaking into my daughter, like you're beautifully and wonderfully made. Like you're strong. I am brave. I'm going to win today. And she has to repeat it in the mirror every morning. And she does it. She loves it. Now she knows it herself. She'll add things onto it. And it's like, you got to instill belief in them at an early age. Um, and that was instilled into me. My mom and my sisters are strong black women who are out in Springfield protests. And I'm like, mom, like, relax, let the young ones do it. But she's been a teacher and principal and like that stuff's really impactful for her. And um, having the diverse background, be able to, when I grew up, was in an all white school, all Hispanic school, all black school. Like you live through a lot of these different emotions, social classes, and you learn how to fit in. Um, and you live through your experiences and you want to make sure that you're giving those to your kids at an early age so that they're seeing that. And I think as Michael Ashton said, the Thunder do a great job um, of inclusion and giving people opportunities. And when you see the different families and people who are working for the team, like that's, that helps when I'm not away and my wife is still going to those events and things of that nature. And my kids are seeing people like them, not like them, but they're fitting in and meshing. And I think the culture on down here at the Thunder is something that should be praised for the way we've attacked these situations. But having a baby girl versus a baby boy, it shouldn't be different, but man, oh man, it is. And my little queen, I, I make sure she's lifted up at all times. She can do no wrong. So I apologize to my wife in advance on that. You know, Paris, can I say something? Absolutely. Um, you know, we have, even us uh, men here have to sometimes put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. I'll tell you a little quick story. Last summer, the Thunder invited me to be a part of the unity and diversity parade, you know, the rainbow parade. And, um, you know, being a Christian man that I am, uh, man, when I posted a picture of me marching, you know, with uh, a unity t-shirt on and, and, and what it meant to support, you know, the gay and lesbian uh, community here in Oklahoma City, you won't believe the backlash I got. I'm talking people were inboxing me left and right. How could you, you're a Christian. How could you say that when you always say biblical things? You know, you're gonna get that. And this is a wonderful platform that we can not only speak about, you know, what's happening right now, you know, to black people in this country, uh, but to, to other ethnic backgrounds, to other uh, persuasions, if you will, because, you know, you're going to always have that, that element, you know, or whatever. I've learned to just respect people for who they are because, you know, if history would teach you anything about me, it would say your wife shouldn't be white because you were a part of desegregation. You were six miles from where Martin Luther King was assassinated. You were right around the corner from when, you know, the Rodney King thing happened. But, you know, love is love. You know, faith is faith. And you have to really, really embrace that. And, and here's my point here. I spoke not knowing uh, to about 1,100 people back in December. I was asked to speak to the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce. And um, they said, well, whatever you want to talk about. And I had to think a long, long time about, well, how do I, what do I want to say, you know, with all that I've been through to this group of people about whatever I want to talk about. And there was just three talking points, and I'll go through them real quick. The first talking point I had was communal, to stay communal. And I think that's where the Oklahoma City Thunder, I think, have done an excellent job since I've been here in my six-year ten, uh, tenure of allowing me to participate in what I want to participate in and what I believe in. And it's just they just keep throwing it out there one after another, and it connects me to the community. You know, I had never done anything like that, you know, being a part of the Rainbow Parade last summer. Never, ever. But it was very, it was something that opened my eyes to a whole nother, you know, uh, 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 group, a whole nother cause, a whole nother fight. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I realized that. And so th the whole thing with communal, we have all these people in the community. We have to connect with them. And then the second point I had was, this was a really tough one at the time in this speech I gave in December was, you know, it was real simple word, empathy. You know, and I talked, you know, I had a, like a 40 minute speech. I probably spent 20 minutes talking about empathy. You know, and we, you, you fellas have all talked about empathy today. 
and you've all talked about communal. And then here's the last thing you guys have all talked about, which is what I talked about back in December, was leading by example. That's that conversation that you have with your young daughter, your young son, that's the example. You are setting that example of how you will communicate with them. Because if you don't talk to them, they're gonna grow up and when they see problems like this or issues like this, they're not gonna wanna talk about it. But when you talk to them about it, you know they're gonna take that example from you. And that's how we lead uh, basically by example. And I had no knowing that, what, three months later, a pandemic was gonna hit the country, an economic fallout was gonna hit the country, and then this racial tension around the country. You know, the race relation question that's popping up, that's been popping up all 58 years of my life that where I've seen so many historical events happen. You know, right now we have a historical event. You have a historical event in your house talking with your kids about it because we, it's, it's inescapable for all of us. We can't move forward unless we figure out how to move forward, you know, I think together. I think that's such a good point, Michael. The, the three pillars, the community, the empathy, and then just the relationship aspect of it and setting that example. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to open up to everybody, um, KJ, you and I have, have discussed this before, but what it means to be a strong Black man. Because I think a, a lot of times, and I think some of you have touched on it, you know, the, the color of your skin says more than who you are in, in situations, certain situations. And I want to pose to you, what does it mean to be a strong black man? What does that look like? And KJ, I'll start with you. What does that mean to you? Uh, yeah, when we spoke about it, uh, we went through, you know, a lot of bullet points. And, um, you know, one main thing that we agreed on is a strong black man is not a threat. Uh, I feel that, you know, when a strong black man shows up and he's, and he's educated, um, and when I say educated, not being not having to have going to school to be educated, but just being educated enough to know what's going on around him, to know how to uh, establish himself in a conversation in a positive way. Um, and, and, you know, being a strong black man, you're also being, in, you're, you're in your community and you're showing up and you're leading by example. Uh, that's another word that we keep coming across. You know, you're leading by example from your own experiences. Um, and you're showing people that, hey, I'm just like you. You know, I come from your community and I want to be here to help you and help you understand that, you know, just because you're from somewhere doesn't mean you have to, you know, abide by those laws, abide, abide by those, uh, by, by, by how you grew up. Um, there's, there's always a way for a strong black man to show you that, hey, excuse me, that uh, even now, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by a couple of guys that had enough courage to share their stories, to share how they're raising their kids, um, to share that, you know, they're raising their kids by faith. Um, like Mike said, faith is huge in the household. Um, being a strong black man is actually showing, showing you how, how that, this, this is how I believe that I can give this, I'm sorry, um, a strong black man is showing you that my faith is how I give my family my best chance or the best chance to succeed. Um, like Audie was saying, he has a daughter, so he's a strong black man and showing her that this is how you are loved by a man. You know, it's just a it's just a whole lot of facets in being a strong black man that, you know, isn't coming off as a threat. And I feel like that's how we're seen right now um, by some people. And I can't understand why. And it's sad. But um I appreciate just just like I said, the strong black man that I'm surrounded by right now who have enough courage to share their stories and to share their background to give somebody else a viewpoint to say, hey, I, I can relate to that. I, I feel like I can learn from him. Mike, what about you? 
Man, it's a deep question. Um, I think a strong black man is one submitted to God first and foremost. I think he is one who takes his responsibility to protect and provide and uh, raise his family, you know, with morals and values. I think a strong black man is secure in who he is. Um, I think a strong black man is able to uh, lead and walk in love um, in spite of, you know, the adversities that he may face. Um, and so those are some of the things that, are, that, that come to mind just, just off the top, but, um, you know, a leader, you know, a provider, um, gives guidance, um, is there, you know, to be a pillar, uh, for his family to look to, um, that they can follow him as he follow God. Michael Ashton. I'll probably piggyback off of what Mike was just saying. I mean, it's hard to really come up with one word to describe that, but the what comes to mind is the term servant leader. And to be a servant leader requires you to be very versatile, requires you to be adaptive. I mean, you have to meet the need where it is. Sometimes you need to be that vocal, bold person. Sometimes you need to sit back and be in that supportive role. You need to be able to form to whatever that situation requires you to do. And in every situation, you need to be a leader. And that's tough because, again, it's so broad of the things that you have to do, but you just have to have that ability to be versatile, to be able to sense what is needed at that moment and execute. Are? Yeah, uh, kind of like what Ashley was saying, it's, it's hard to sum into one what a strong black man is, but I mean, just to name a few, I mean, when I think about, when I think about that question, um, is someone that is um, strong, uh, firm, firm to their beliefs, firm to their character. Um, and, you know, with those, with that foundation, you know, despite the situations that come up, sorry, let me bring you. You know, strong black man is just someone that is, you know, firm to their character, firm to their beliefs. Um, and, and we've all been, had different experiences, you know, throughout life. And that has all molded us to the professional that we are today, the leaders that we are today. We're all leaders in our own way. We're all firm to our beliefs in our own way. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and we've all talked about our households. We are all leaders of our households. Um, so those are kind of things that I think about whenever I think about strong black men. Will, what, is, what does it mean to you? What Definition of a strong black man, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so I'd say the definition of a strong black man is mm -hmm. someone I'm still striving to be. Um, Fortunately, I've had a lot of examples in my life from my father to my uncles to my grandfathers who are no longer with us who have shown the way and been that example to me. So things that initially pop into my mind, um, being a mighty man of God, that's that's truly um, where it starts. Um, I would say a strong black man is unafraid. A strong black man is someone who's going to take care of his business, who's never satisfied who's going to be a lifelong learner. Um, as I said earlier, is going to be a provider for his family, um, a protector of his family, someone that is going to be humble, show love, be kind, um, but also is going to own their mistakes and know they're not perfect, but work on those and, and show their vulnerabilities to let the kids and the people who you're around know that it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to fail, um, but it's not okay not to try. And that's some of the things that were instilled in me at a young age. And, things that you you best believe I'm instilling in my kids right now. So I've had some great examples. I've met some great people and have great friends and great people within this organization that when I got here as a 21 year old intern 12 years ago, held me under their wings um, on both coaches, players, front office staff, like alike. So I've been blessed and fortunate um, to see examples of that and within the church, within the work, within sports. And uh, that's something when I'm, still striving to be still striving to be i love that michael cage 
Well, you know, uh, you know, I was raised by my mother and father, you know, and I know, I don't know if any of you here um, were single parent uh, household or whatever. I was very fortunate that I had a mom and dad, very, both very strong, uh, both very um, um, motivated to make sure that I would go further than they did. And, and I really appreciate that. And, and some of the things that were taught to me by them at a young age still serves me today. And there was one thing I, I thought, even when, a when I was a child, what a strong black man was, what I was taught, you know, where I, I had trouble understanding. Like, you know, my father used to say, you know, you gotta be twice as good. You gotta be twice as smart. And he said, you can't make mistakes because one mistake will cost you. And, and you know, I going, well, Pops, I play basketball. I make mistakes all the time. It's called a turnover. And I look at it on the stat sheet and you get mad at me on the drive home. You know, he's just go, no, no, that's different. I said, well, Pops, come on. You know, I said, I got to make a mistake, you know, because I was the type of kid growing up in the South. You know, I had all this input, you know, and this, this, this support system. Pretty much what you, you fellas are talking about. And I think it's great that when you talk about, you know, what it is to, to be a strong black man, I, I think one of the, the, the greatest components along with don't be afraid to make a mistake. You know, it's a part of it. Don't be hard on yourself when you fail. Because, you know, I was taught you, you can't make a mistake. You have to, you have to go and you have to do this because they're not gonna give you a second chance. And I was like, well, 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 well you know, I think I'll get a second chance, won't I? You know, and so, what you guys are really basically have been saying is that you're teaching your kids a lot of these principles and all the things you learn as a child are not all the things that serve you when you get older. As you get older, sometimes you can, you know, you adjust, you make, you know, uh, little add-ons to certain things that you were taught. And I think one of the biggest things is, man, you're going to make mistakes, but get up, you know, you know, when you make that mistake, acknowledge it, Admit it, admit it to your wife, I couldn't hear what ad, admit it to your kids, you know, admit it to everybody. I'm sorry, that was Siri. Siri started talking, you know, she says, you need to wrap this she up. She wanted to so, get in on the conversation too. You know, <laughs> you know it, it, well, my dad used to say stuff like that. You know, my dad used to say stuff when I was younger, like, you know, same thing, make you laugh, make you cry. And I would look at him and dad, I'm seven. I don't understand what that means, man. You know, uh, well, a uh, leopard never changes his spot. I'm going, Pops, I'm nine. I don't get that. But you know what? When you get older, you understand a lot of the things that your parents said to you that didn't make sense when you were a kid. And you turn around and find yourself repeating that to your kids. And I think that's that support system. You know, fellas, support your kids. You know, they're different, man. They're millennials. I don't know what they call you guys as kids, you know, I don't know what the new word is today. You know, they're not afraid, you know, they, they want to go to full distance. You know, they don't care about left or right. They're just going to go for it. And, and they're going to go at their own pace. Give them that space. And I think my parents gave me that space too. But more importantly, I had that support system. I could go to my brothers when I got into trouble, or I could go to a teacher, I could go to a coach, I could go to my dad, I could go to my mom. That time is gonna come with you and your kids and they gotta know that they can come there and be allowed to make that mistake because that support system, those conversations, all of that is gonna to come to fruition at some point in time when they get into high school or college or like my kids post-college where we have more adult conversations now than we did when they were kids because you know they understand, they've been out in the world and they've experienced some things, they've made some mistakes, they've done some great things, you're proud of them, you gotta be proud of them when they don't make the, when they don't do great things. And I think that's really been the type of, I guess, influence, that strong figure, you know, that I've tried to be uh, with my family. It just goes back to what you guys have all said, the example, the example that you set, man, it's hard, it's hard for them to get off that pass, path when that example is set by you, you know, and it goes back to a whole lot of expressions, put your money where your mouth is, you know, talk is cheap, you know, all that stuff, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Well, look at you fellas, the proof 
is in all you're putting. I mean, just listening to your talk, man, it's like inspiring uh, to me. And I think you're on the right path. So, you know, that's, that's the whole, you know, I think, you know, point for me with what a strong black man is. It's strong. It's being sympathetic. It's showing empathy. It's being, you know, uncomfortable. You know, I'm sure all you guys have stepped out on a limb where somebody told you, you can't do this, Will. Mike, you can't do this. KJ, you can't do this. You know, I'm sure everybody's heard that. You can't do, you can't, can't, can't. And, and, and you went out there and you made it happen. I think that's the strength. And those are the things that I think show the strength in, in, in a black man and how important he is in your family. To answer your question, Michael, I'm not sure what they're going to call this generation coming up, but it's definitely a young one. And I love all of these answers, example, strength, confidence, faith, that, that's so important. And before we close, I just want to open up the floor for any, any final words. I know, Will, you, you mentioned the hope that you have during all of this. And same thing for you, Michael Ashton, young kids growing up, what hope do you have for them going into the world? Well, hopefully, I mean, from what my parents have instilled in me is, you know, they hope that I continue to carry the torch and go further than what they have gone. So, I mean, really, that's kind of hoping, that's what I'm trying to do for my children give them the foundation to where they have the ability to take, I mean, what we're talking about now, just what we're doing with the world right now, equip them with what they need so they can take this even further, you know, ensure that they're successful, ensure that they have the tools needed to succeed in this tough life, regardless of the obstacles that they're going to have to overcome because of the color of their skin. Yeah. Hope is obviously, um, vital to instilling into our children but um, for me hope faith and love and if you're a believer the greatest of all those is love so pouring into them um, and then having them pour into others is something that will be consistent from now until they're going through whatever the next phase is for them Um, but with with the kids you, you always want them to have a better life and not have to experience the things we did so that's where the hope comes in Um, instilling in them that there's power in their story and their background and their uniqueness and their Native American heritage and and their Black heritage and sharing the different cultures, being around our families and going to different events. But also I've been fortunate within the organization to travel to multiple different continents and countries and exposing them, sometimes taking them. Like I got my passport when I was 25. They got theirs when they were one and two. So like exposing them to different things and letting them see that. Um, So that stuff's important to let them know that there's more than just what they're living right now. And I guess lastly, to kind of close it up, like we see the impact um, that people are having right now. And it's not just in Minneapolis. It's not just in Louisville. Um, It's not just in Georgia or in Atlanta, all these things that we're seeing. There's protests and there's people speaking up in every state, but it's also worldly. Other countries are speaking on injustices. Other countries are fighting with us. Other countries are taking a knee. Um, so while it's global and it's catching this spread, um, you hope that there's some movement and some power and some changes being made um, from all of this. But I don't want people to think that it's not right here in Oklahoma City as well and not around us. Um, so while you see it in the news in some of these other cities, um, it's not too long ago where I remember being here just up in Edmond um, when everything was happening with Isaiah Lewis. I remember having to go to Tulsa for games with Terrence Crutcher. And people don't know about some of these things, aren't as up to date on some of these things, are knowledgeable on them, but it's happening around us. Um, There's times where my colleagues are being pulled over, our players are being pulled over for certain reasons. It's happened to me where I got pulled over a block away from the Mercedes dealership. And his first question was, whose car is this? And it's like, hold on, wait a minute. Like, why am I being stopped? And you got to go through the process. But like, you trigger yourself to figure it out. But you know that things are happening. Things necessarily aren't changing. They're closer to home than we think. And I want to make sure people know that 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 is going on. And we're fighting and we're standing and we're 
with everyone that's going through this stuff right now. And we're hoping change is going to come from it. I love what all of you have talked about so far today. And a lot, like all of you mentioned, uh, there's no handbook for fatherhood, much less black fatherhood. And so I, I appreciate all of you being here today, sharing your unique individual experiences. I think that's so important throughout all of this to know that everybody has a different perspective, a different viewpoint on life in general. So I appreciate you all being here and hopefully that this can serve as a resource for someone else as well. So I appreciate you all taking the time out to be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paris. Thank you, Thank you Paris. This is great. Everybody.